Bible says be very careful not to do your own good deeds publicly to be seen by men otherwise you will have no reward prepared and awaiting for you with your father who is in heaven and so who whatever you give to the poor and do acts of kindness do not blow a trumpet before you to advertise it as the hypocrites do like actors acting out in a role in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored and recognized and praised by men oh, yeah. i assure you that most solemnly say to you they already have the reward in full but when you give to the poor and do your acts of kindness do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing give in complete secrecy so that your charitable acts will be done in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you also when you pray do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray publicly, standing in the synagogues on the corner of the streets, so that they may be seen by men. I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you pray, go unto your most private room, close the door and pray to your Father, who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You may be seated. I just titled this the applause of men. You know, in our verses today, Jesus is talking in the greatest sermon that was ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever preached. And that was Jesus Christ. You ever want to know what the greatest sermon ever preached was, you can go to the book of Matthew, start in chapter 5, work your way to parts of, ends of uh, chapter 7, you got yourself the greatest sermon ever preached. But in the midst of all of this, he talks about the applause of men. He talks about what it's like for men to want to have the appreciation and have the, 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 the uh, okay of men. And God says, that's not how to live your life. We should be living it for the Lord and for the honor of our God. When you look for the applause of men and you're looking for men to like you, it's a never ending battle. Because once they like you, you gotta maintain that. And that's tricky because every person you run into that you wanna please, has a different theory on what they think is cool, what they think is not. Most people that I know that are looking for the applause of men are having a problem looking for identity and who they are. But when you become a child of God, then your identity is found in the person of Jesus Christ, amen? Your identity is found in the Lord. You no longer have to strive to be seen by men. You no longer have to be seen by men to have them appreciate who you are. Because I just come and I just do whatever God has called me to do. And by doing what God has called me to do, I leave it up to Him to be able to register in your hearts and your souls what is good and what is needed for you to be able to hear. But I'm not going to come into this place and just tell you what you want to hear because I, because I know what you want to hear. I'm just not that kind of person. And I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and tell you things that ain't true. At least not on purpose. So I don't look for the applause of men. I gave up on that a long time ago. It used to drive me nuts to be a part of a, a congregation, a part of a group of people that were always looking to have people be pleasing. And when we look at our scripture verses today, the Pharisees were the most religious sect of the people that were back in them days. And whenever they had a, a festival, they would stand on the corners with all their cool religious garb on, their cool hats and all the expensive jewelry and everything they had and they'd stand there and they'd be praying on the corners 
And all the common folk that walked by him to the temple would say, man, that's a really holy person there. Look at that person on the corner there. They're really holy. Look at them. And Jesus says, you know what? When you're looking to please man instead of God, when that becomes the focal point of who you are, what you got on earth by people saying, yeah, that guy was really cool, that's all you're getting for a reward. You got your reward. You're looking to please man, you're looking for people to think that you're cool and you're all that in a bag of chips. That's all you got, that's all you're gonna get. But the Lord says that we are supposed to look for our identity in Him and not in man. And not let people know what we're doing and, and not boast in who we are and what we're doing for the sake of people to say ooh and ah about who we are. You know, sometimes I come in here and I, I announce to you that we're going to a prison, we're going to another place to be able to preach. I don't do that to boast about who I am. I just try to show you maybe you might want to pray for us because I certainly need it. And number two, I never know what's going to happen so I could use covet some prayer there. But I'm just telling you where I'm at and what I'm doing. But I'm not looking for your, the applause of men by telling you those things. I just find it awfully awesome to be able to share what God's doing in my life because I know the things that he's doing in my life, he wants to do in yours as well. All the things that I'm doing, that, he, that I'm currently doing, it's not just for me, but it's for an illustration to see what God could do with a, a former drunkard, a former drug addict, and a former guy that almost went to prison for battery. I'm just telling you what, what a God that could transform your life could do with the man when he sold out. That's all I'm doing. But I don't come up here to the Milwaukee Rescue Mission and say, you know what, I need to put another notch in my belt and I need to go on all the social networks and I need to tell everybody, oh, I'm down at the Rescue Mission, I'm down here, look at me, look what I'm doing. I don't do that. I let people know what I'm doing that support me. I certainly notate what I'm doing and express the joy that I have for being here. But it's not to be for the applause of men. I certainly don't look for that, but I look for the, what God has for me. Because God takes care of me, and God will take care of you. And whatever we do for the praise of God's glory, He'll work it out. But we're not to be for the applause of men. And I've noticed that in the years of ministry that when people are shaken with an identity, they don't know who they are, they're looking for that identity through men. God will give you who you are in Christ. He'll give you that identity when you search Him. When you search Him with your whole heart, and you start reading the Word, and you start praying, you say, Lord, I want to be known by you. Then you could be like a Peter who was a common fisherman walking on the side of the road down in Galilee when Jesus confronted him and said, come to follow me. He had all of the tools to be great. And sometimes he did great and wonderful things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he was under the control of God, when he was seeking his identity in Christ. He was a wonderful man of God preaching to all the people on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people were saved in the midst of all these angry people that didn't want to hear him. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, when he lived for God, it came to the point where it didn't matter what people thought of him. It didn't matter how much people didn't dislike him because he was a preacher. It didn't matter at all because he was just following what God said. Now we look at our verses today, we see that God wants to be able to say the same thing about you. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is taken to the desert by the enemy of your soul and mine. And he's tempting Jesus to do his own thing and just get away from what your father's told you to do. Jesus continually said, I didn't come to do my own will. I come to do what the father sent me. But the, the devil took him to the desert and said, hey, Forget about doing your dad's stuff. Forget about doing the father's stuff. Do your own thing. Be your own God. Be your own man. And it comes to the end, and in 
Matthew 4, 10, Jesus said, the Lord said to him, it's not about me, but it's about the will of my Father. In verse 10, he says, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only you shall serve. It's not about me, Jesus is saying. It's not about if I could jump off a building. It's not about me if I could do a million different things. It's about what my Father has told me to do. It's about being obedient to what the Father has asked me to do. That's what it's all about. Because God keeps my schedule for me. He tells me where to go. He tells me where not to go. He tells me what places I preach at. He tells me where I don't preach at. And I don't argue with him and say, you know, Lord, I wish I could go here. I wish I could go there. I, I let him know that once in a while. But it's, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that you have that I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing whatever the Lord wants. And if the Lord wants me to do something, he'll have me there. <clears throat> Is anybody catching on to what I'm saying? But in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says this, Is there any encouragement for, from be, belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish and try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think it equally. Equality with God as some cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself to the obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him a name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in, every, in heaven and on earth and under, and under earth and every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Bible clearly says that those that are first will be what? And those that are last will be? You see, it's opposite of what this world would have you to believe. The kingdom of God operates in an opposite fashion. Those who are obedient to God, those are the ones that will have the rewards in heaven. Those are the ones that he can even reward here. If you do the right things, you'll just be honored and you'll be well rewarded. If you follow all the Levitical laws that are in the book of Leviticus, you're going to live, even if you don't know Christ, you're going to live longer. If you follow the sanitary laws, if you follow just the laws in the book of Leviticus, you may not even know who Jesus Christ is, but you're going to live a longer life by following him. But how much more would you know Jesus when you make him your Lord and Savior? And you allow him to be a part of your life. And you just say, you know what? I'm taking up the cross of Christ. I'm laying down my own cross. I'm not doing my own thing no more. I'm just going to do whatever you want, Lord. Just give yourself to the Lord and surrender yourself to him and say, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? What it is, is it about my life that you would want me to change? What is it about me and the gifts, the talents that you gave me? What is it about them that I could use for the praise of your glory? And you see, because I'm a, a head of a ministry, I would like to do my own thing. I, there's times I just would love to do my own thing, but I can't. I have to think of the other people that are involved in the ministry. I have to think about them first before me. I have to take out a servant's heart like Jesus did. I have to think like Christ and go, what's in the best interest of those that work with me? You know, I got Buddy, he was here the other night. I got Carolina, I got Brian. And I got a, another couple that comes to the prisons with me. And then I got my friend James that used to work here. 
all people are all part of the ministry. And I have to think when I'm scheduling, I have to think when I'm coming here, what's in the best interest for them? And sometimes it gets to be hard. Sometimes you just wish that you were just doing it all by yourself, but you can't. The Bible says that you need to esteem others greater than yourself. Jesus came and he divested himself all his glory. He was certainly God, but he came to this earth and he gave up the privileges of being God in heaven and he came to this earth. Yes, he was still God, but then he took on the form of man. And don't ask me to explain it all because I can't. I just know he did. You see, God came from heaven and he was born a normal human being in a stable. You would think if Jesus Christ was God, he'd be coming down here, he'd be at the five, five star hotel. He'd be at the finest hotel there was in Israel. But there wasn't even room for him in the end, so he ended up being born in a manger. He ended up being humble. And all the time he was God, but all the time he said, I've not come to do my will. I've not come to do my own thing. I've come to do what the Father has sent me to do. I've come to do what the Father has declared unto me. And he was never looking for the applause of men. He was never looking, but he was always just telling the truth. He was just telling the truth to people that needed to hear it. And one thing I have found out in ministry, guys, is that when I just tell you the flat out truth, sometimes it's hard to be able to say it, but I'm happy I do. I say it with all the love I can, and I'm happy it reaches the heart that knows who I am in starting out of my ninth year here. It just says, you know what? I, I just believe Pastor Mike is just saying the right thing. I just believe that brother, brother cares for us. He's just saying the right thing. You may disagree. You may just disagree, but that's okay. Whatever the Word of God says, that's what's true. That's what the Bible says. May the Word of God be true and every man a liar. So I've come to tell you the truth because it's the truth that will set you free. It will be the truth that will divide out in your life the things that are not of God and the things that are. It's the Word of God and the truth of the Bible that will be able to show you and tell you what's real and what's not. In 1 Samuel 15, there was the first king by the name of Saul. Saul was a tall, handsome man. Everybody liked him. All the other countries had kings. Israel did not have a king. They had God. And they said, we don't want God anymore. We want a king. And so God stood back and let them have their own king. They wanted Saul. And Saul became this man who was looking out for himself. Everything was about me, myself and I. And every time he made a mistake, it wasn't his own fault. It was somebody else's fault that things happened the way they did. And we are told in 1 Samuel 15 that the Lord had told him to go out and completely destroy the Amalekites. Completely take them out. And so in 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 17, the Bible says, Samuel said, it is not true that even though you were small and significant in your own eyes, you were made head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, totally destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them till they are all eliminated. That was what God told him to do. And he kind of follows it, but then he says, You know what? I'm going to keep some of the stuff instead of destroying it all. Because I'm looking at the people and they're like appreciating me. They're loving me because I'm allowing them to have some of the stuff that was supposed to be destroyed. And so to please man, to please man, King Saul disobeyed God. To please God, he didn't seek after what was, God was saying 
But he looked out and he saw the people that were all excited about keeping back part of what was supposed to be destroyed. And he said, you know what? I don't think God's going to matter about that stuff. I don't think God's going to care. Because when you drop down to verse 20, he says this. Saul said to Samuel, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone on a mission to which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agog, the king of the Amalekite, and have completely destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the best of things that were to be totally destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal, Samuel said. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? God's looking for obedience. He's not looking for sacrifice. He told Saul, I want you to completely destroy the Amalekites. He told Saul that this is what I'm asking you to do. And sometimes, gentlemen, you're put into a situation where you have to just do the right thing. And you have to be obedient to what God is saying. But in all of that, it's difficult. It's hard. The task becomes hard. Because you're asked to go way beyond what you know to do in your own heart. And you need to call on God and say, God, give me the strength to be able to carry out what you're asking me because I can't do it on my own. And God will do that. If you're in a position today, gentlemen, as you walk into this 445 and you're put into a spot where you've got to do the right thing, you know you've got to do the right thing, you just don't know how you're going to do it, I suggest to you that you call upon the name of the Lord and ask the Lord, how do I get this? Last week, two weeks ago, I was asked by a prison that I go to, they, serve, they hold their services on Monday, and they wanted me to come. And I can't come because I'm already going to Israel with our church, and I've got a couple of vacations already scheduled, i got no time to be able to go. But yet I heard the Lord clearly tell me to go to this prison. And so I wanted to go there, I wanted to preach, I wanted to, the guys like me there at this maximum security prison, and I like going, but the unfortunate part is they have to hold their services on Monday, and I understand why. So I'm not, I'm not complaining that they do, I understand why they have to do it. But I went before the Lord and I said, Lord, you said it was about the guys. You showed me that you wanted me to go to this prison. But I don't know how to make it happen because I only got so much vacation time and when that's done, I won't be able to go. I've only got so much time off of work, so how am I gonna be able to make it up to this prison? And I put it before the Lord and said, Lord, how am I gonna have this? How am I gonna do this? I don't know how. And I just pleaded with God, I said, God, just show me a way. But I did say this in my prayer, guys. I said, you know what? I know there's a way. I don't know what it is in my little Polish brain, but I know there's a way. So I leave it to you, Lord, to reveal it to me that I can come to my boss and say, hey, this is what I want to do. So two days later, a lady comes into my office and she says, I told her what was going on. She said, well, why don't you just take that day off without paying and work the other four days, 10 hour shifts and you'll have your 40 hours. I said, well, can I do that? She goes, we do it all the time. So I went to my boss and I'm like, oh boy, I hope he says yes. Oh boy, I hope he says okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't even get up what I wanted to do. And he goes, just tell me what you want to do and I'll approve it, just be happy. It was already settled. It was a done deal before I even asked him. But I had to come to the point where somebody had to tell me what the answer was so I could go to my boss and say, hey, can I do this? But when it all happened, my boss was already prepared by the Holy Spirit of God to say, just tell him what he wants and just let him have it. And I'm telling you, that's the way God will operate in your life as well. God already wants to know, already knows what he wants you to do. He already knows how he wants to do it. He just needs you to yield to him and say, hey, I, I know what you want. And I have found this, that I don't need to be the big man on campus. I don't need to have the man without being all the answers. I don't need to have that. 
If you ask me something, if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and say, oh yeah, I'm a major scholar, I can answer that question for you. No, I'll have to look it up and get back to you next time I see you. Because I don't know the answer. But I'm not here for the applause of men. And sometimes I've asked to preach things here that are hard, they're difficult. Sometimes the Lord tells me to say things and I just go, really Lord, you really want me to talk about that tonight? I really wish I could just be dancing my way through a 445 sometimes, but God says, no, this is the subject matter. And I have to be obedient to God because that's what he's called me to do. That's what he's called me to do. He's not called me to do, to just come here and entertain you. I got nothing to offer you guys that I, I can help you with. I, I gotta hear from God. I gotta pray to God. I gotta I gotta get in my closet like this man is talking to like that the like the like the uh, Jesus was talking about in Matthew six. I gotta get into my prayer closet and I gotta find out what it is. Cause I don't always know. I don't always know the situations. In fact, most of the time I don't even know the answer, but I know who has the answer wants to give it to me. I'm fine, I know exactly what to do then. I asked the Lord in my weekly devotion that I've been putting out. We had a, a meeting, a church meeting, and my pastor said, is there any needs that you have? I said, yes, I need people to help me write my devotion. I need people to help me edit. I, I'm busy. I don't always have time to be able to do it the right way, and I have two people now that are willing to help me on top of the other people that are doing the other stuff. And so I, I have them people help me. But you know how I got it? I asked. If I don't know what it is, I asked God. I said, God, how do I do this? How do I make this work? God, I got to free up some time. I got to prepare for a sermon. I got to be able to do what you asked me to do. How do I do it? It's not about me. It's not about the applause of men. I'm not going to stand on the street corner and come in here with an $800,000 silk Italian suit and tell you I've got all the answers because that's not who I am. But I do know who does have the answers and it's God. I just come to be obedient like Christ said when he came out out of the wilderness. It's not about me. It's not about doing my own thing. But it's about surrendering to Christ and allowing God to work through me the way he wants. Because you will find, gentlemen, the more that you surrender to God, the more you let him have your heart and have your life, the more he could do with you. Amen? The more he could use you when you don't run friction against what he wants. And you're willing to say, you know what, God, do whatever you want with me. I, I don't even care. You want me to do this, you want me to do that. And when I first gave my life in 1992, I said to the Lord, I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I made him that promise. Above all that I want. And, and, and sometimes, I, and, and sometimes, guys, can, can I just be real with you before I close? Sometimes I got my fishing rod and I got my tackle box in the back of my SUV and I want to go fishing. And I want to catch some big honking fish. And, and, I, and, I, and in the spring and the fall, I love going down to the Lake Michigan off the rivers down there, especially Grant Park, and catching some of them rainbows and catching some of those cohos, and especially with those big browns that come in in the spring and fall. Sometimes I love to be able to do that. But then things happen and then I can't go. I can't say, forget about the people that I'm supposed to serve and go down and go fishing. And sometimes God tells you to relax, have peace, and go and be happy, and, and just put the ministry stuff aside, but sometimes you just can't. And so sometimes, gentlemen, you find that your walk with God will cause friction in your life. But I tell you, the best thing you could ever do in your life is to surrender to God and say, God, you saved me. You took me out of the miry clay. You did, you did all this work. I didn't do it. And so, Lord God, I am, I am just thankful. I'm just thankful for what you did in my life.